Hey guys, I'm Big Mike, and like always, I'd like to thank you for being here today. Today we have a webinar from Ernie Chan titled Factor Models in Practice. Ernie's going to be giving a very detailed look into factor models in the webinar. Factor models are well known among long-term investors who favor stock selection models, but there are some exotic factors from which shorter-term traders can also benefit. Ernie will talk about various factor model techniques and the more exotic factors recently discovered. We'll also be giving away five autographed copies of Ernie's newest book titled Algorithmic Trading, Winning Strategies and Their Rationale. Uh, if you are uh, wanting to win one of those autographed books, you need to have your BMT username ready. At the end of the presentation, Ernie will uh, ask five questions, and if you get the question answered correctly, I will be asking you for your BMT username, and that's how I will get in touch with you after the webinar to get you the autographed book. So please have that ready. The webinar is being recorded like always. I'll post the recording on BMT sometime tomorrow. If you're watching the recording on YouTube, please do us a favor and give it a thumbs up if you like it. Okay, and with all that, I will now turn things over to Ernie. Okay, Ernie, you should see the option to share your screen on the top left of the panel. Okay, let me... Uh make sure that I'm uh, uh, showing the correct uh, screen here okay um, are you able to see my uh, uh, presentation yes we have the Microsoft Word document so you need to oh, change okay. that <laughs> let me see oh, all right that, uh, let's see here <laughs> <laughs> that, Interesting that I have first selected uh, one screen and now it refused to let me switch to the other one. But uh, anyhow. Okay, well, let me, I can take control back and then we can try it again. Hang on. All right. All right. So let me give it back to you. Okay. Try it again. Okay. Do you see uh, my presentation? No, we're still on the MATLAB screen. Okay, then let me. Uh, Let's, uh, why don't you take control again and then I will have to uh, go into that the menu to select. Okay. Okay. Okay, now let me make sure that i um, wondering which one is screen of monitor one. Okay, okay, now this one. This is, okay. All right, I think that's okay, right? You can yeah, see now we've got the PowerPoint. Yep. All right. Then. All right. Thanks. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Thanks again for the introduction, uh, Mike, uh, and uh, you know, we're, uh, welcome to, to you, everybody, for coming to my uh, my webinar. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, let me uh, run through a quick uh, uh, introduction. Uh, I. Uh, used to work in machine learning at IBM TJ Watson lab and uh, bef uh, before I became a uh, quant research and trader for Morgan Stanley, Credit Suisse and a number of other hedge funds. Uh, currently I am a principal of QTS Capital Management which manages a hedge fund as well as uh, separate kind accounts. And um, uh, I uh, also wrote two books, one is called Quantitative Trading and the second one more recently is called Algorithmic Trading and that's the one that Mike uh, will be giving out uh, at the end of this uh, webinar. And also I have been a uh, uh, blogger, uh, you can find my blog at dbchen.blogspot.com. So without further ado, let's, let's talk about uh, factors. Uh, why, uh, the first question is why am I interested in factor models uh, lately? Uh, the reason has to do with the low volatility uh, in the markets. Uh, you know, for traders, low volatility is not good because that 
so generally means that uh, you cannot generate high returns from this uh, short-term uh, trades. Um, even for the ultra high frequency trader, as you may have uh, read in the in the media, uh, they are no longer the um, the goose that uh, lay the golden eggs. Uh, basically, uh, they are not turning out cash uh, day in and day out, day out anymore because of this suppressed liquidity and volatility in the market. So, does that mean that we should give up as a trader as a result? Uh, of course not. You know, we the, there is a remedy to this, and the remedy is to increase the holding period. Uh, you know. The time scale, has, uh, as uh, we, we know, is inversely proportional to volatility. So if the volatility drops, we should increase the natural time scale of our holding period. And for longer holding period trades, factor models are well suited. And uh, you know that's that's because uh, that 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 is uh, evidenced by the fact that most uh, long-term investor pension funds and the like uh, are typically using factor models in their stock selection. Uh, now there's one drawback of course, you know, you can't have everything, you know, by holding longer period you do have one drawback which is that uh, your sharp ratio is going to be lower but that cannot be helped, uh, that just, we just have to suffer this risk and actually that ties in to the risk uh, inherent in factor models and that, that uh, we will be talking about in a bit. So what is uh, a factor, uh, or there's another term for it, it's called factor loading. Factor and factor loading are two sides of the coins, and uh, of the same coin, and we will talk about uh, uh, you know, what that distinction is in a bit. Uh, to a trader, they are just simply any variable that we can use to predict returns. If you think of a uh, linear regression model, you know, you have uh, all these independent variables and the dependent variable might be future returns. So you can think of any of these uh, independent variables as factors. That's the simplistic uh, the trader way of looking at a factor model. For a finance professor, there is a little bit more technical. That, you know, it's not simply any independent variable, but the only certain independent variable uh, qualify as factor. Um, now, examples of factors would be uh, you know, any number in the financial statement of a company or any technical indicator. So things like book to market ratio of a company, uh, return on equity, uh, dividend yield, or even simply just a recent uh, one month return. These are factors, uh, definitely factors, and they are particularly called cross-sectional factor. The reason they're called cross-sectional uh, factor is that, um, uh, you know, well, first of all, cross-sectional factors are directly observable. You can measure, you know exactly by reading the financial statement what the book-to-market ratio is. And also, uh, they differ for every stock. You know, every stock has a different different in you, has a different recent return. So that's what is called cross-sectional. You know, cross-sectional across all the stocks, the factors are different. Uh, now, in, actually, to be more precise, these are called, uh, you know, whenever you're talking about these kind of uh, cross-sectional factors, they are actually uh, more precisely called factor loadings. Uh, you know, the, the, they are not called factors, because factors usually uh, mean that they have the units of, of return, but you know, certainly book to price ratio, a book to market ratio or dividend yield, they do not have the dimension of return. So anyhow, they are uh, you know, sometimes called cross-sectional factor because they are observable and they depend on the specific stock. Uh, there are other kind of factors, however, besides these cross-sectional factor, and they are things such as macroeconomic variables. And they are called time series factor, by the way. Uh, examples of these macroeconomic variable would be, you know, let's say the return of uh, gold futures, uh, GDP growth, uh, inflation rate, you know, uh, and uh, also s these two favorite uh, factors called HML and SMB. HML is the uh, shorthand for high minus low. That is the difference in returns between a, um, a portfolio with high uh, book to market ratio minus the return of a portfolio with low book to market ratio. In other words, this is a value factor. HML return is a value factor. If the uh, high book to market stocks outperform low to low, low book to market stocks, HML will be a large number. So, a, a um, if the market currently values, uh, you know. Uh, 
bit up value stock, you know, then HML will be a uh, will be a you know big number. Otherwise, if the market now favors growth stock, HML will be small or even negative number. Uh, similarly, SMB is small minus big. Small minus big means that uh, is the difference in returns between a portfolio of small cap stocks minus uh, big cap stocks. Okay, so again, if SMB is a small number, that means that the current market favors small caps. If uh, SMB is a negative or very small number, that means that the market currently favors uh, big cap stocks. So these uh, now HML and SMB are return of two portfolios. They are not returns of a specific stock. Therefore, they are not cross-sectional factor. They are time series factor. They are the same for every stock. Uh, but they certainly differ from one time period to another. That's why they call time series uh, factors. Um, now, despite the fact that uh, you know these factors are you know common among all stock at one snapshot in time, uh, obviously the factor loading uh, uh, with respect to these factors are going to be different for different stocks. So, factor loading you can think of uh, is the regression coefficient in this case. Uh, the factor loading is the regression coefficient of a stock's return with respect to these sort of uh, macroeconomic factors. And obviously they're going to be different uh, at, uh, for different stock and of course they're also going to be different at different time. So that's the, uh, the you know, the nature. That's, that's sort of an illustration of what the time, uh, you know, factor loading is and an illustration of the difference between time series and cross-sectional factors. So that's all very good. That just tells us, you know, what sort of this is just a grammar of factor model. It doesn't tell us anything useful as yet. Uh, but before we get into anything useful, let's drill down a little bit about what, why are, uh, you, know, you know, if I say that you know, basically every variable, every independent variable can be considered a factor, why are the uh, core factors? What's so interesting? You know, that sounds too general. And indeed, the, uh, the definition I gave earlier is a bit too general. To be more specific, a factor means that this variable will bring both returns and risk to the investor. Now that's the risk part is actually important. Uh, for example, if we are looking at the HML factor, that is to say high minus low, you know, high book to market stock portfolio return minus the low book to market stock portfolio return. Now, if this, if people are uh, trading uh, on this particular factor, uh, you will typically be buying value stock and shorting growth stocks because HML is uh, m most stocks has a positive, uh, well, all the uh, um, uh, HMA is typically uh, positive, okay, so, you know, over a long period of time on average, uh, it, it high book to market stock uh, does outperform low, to bo uh, low book to market stock. So, you, you, in general, you should be indeed buying value stock and, and shorting growth stock. But this, although it will bring you a good return over the long run, uh, it does bring with risk, and the risk is that there are long period of time that are, that this model does suffer drawdown, uh, particularly during financial crisis. So, by buying this factor, by trading on this factor, it will bring you long-term return, but severe short-term risk in the form of uh, drawdown during financial crisis. It's like a mean reverting model. Every, uh, you know, many of you might know that in a mean reverting model, uh, it you know churn out cash most times, but occasionally when there's a financial crisis, uh, you will just lose a large amount of money. It's also similar to shorting options. Shorting options bring you cash uh, over time, but occasionally you will be severely hurt by um, major market movement. So that's the same idea. All these factors uh, come with risk which manifests itself as drawdown. And so, the, but why is this risk important? The risk is important because they are actually, again, the, the other side of the coin of returns. The returns are present because of the risk. You can think of it that way, is that uh, you know, if there is no risk, everybody will be piling into this factor. You know, if, if buying value stock and shorting growth stock is always great, no, there's no drawdown. You know, every day you just buy value and short growth is going to generate 10% return a year. Everybody would be doing that. And as a result, this 
factor will be arbitraged away. So that's the key thing about factor is that they cannot be easily arbitraged away. The reason they cannot be arbitraged away easily is because it, it does come with this unpleasant risk. And not every investor, not every trader want to take those risks. For example, I know that shorting options is going to generate cash, but I'm very hesitant to do it because I know that once in a while I will be clean out. So even though there is a factor return on options, I consider those period where I will suffer severe drawdown too much to bear and therefore I don't trade, I don't short options. Similarly for many other factors, you know that there is return but you still don't want to take the, uh, take the risk of generating those returns and therefore those returns are not arbitrage away and that's the you know sort of the financial professor reasoning for calling certain uh, predictive variables factors is that they cannot be arbitrage away uh, uh, due to the risk and now sometimes however that just because they cannot be arbitrage away does not mean however that the factor returns will always be positive because sometimes both the risk and the return will diminish right if certain um, risk can be alleviated by somehow, uh, by you know maybe a lot of people trading it, uh, that there's no risk anymore, then the return will also diminish because without risk there no one is uh, you know interested in the, you know, that the well without the, uh, without the risk you sh should not deserve the return. Arbitrageurs will indeed arbitrage against this model until there's no return. An example would be the S, actually the SMB factor. Uh, it, traditionally small cap generate higher return than big cap stock, a portfolio of small cap stock will uh, you know, return higher than the big cap stock, but in the recent 20 years, let's say, the fact this factor become weaker and weaker and there's no longer much return uh, to, to generate and because there's, again, the reason is that there's, again, diminishing risk in holding small cap stocks, especially a portfolio of small cap stocks. So that's the reason why, you know, this factor is now uh, pretty much relegated to the dustbin of history, if you might want to say that. Now, okay, so that's the uh, sort of the, you know, the fundamentals of factor models, but what, uh, how do we compute it? Now, again, in computing a factor, math, uh, you know, com uh, you know, in, you, you, programmatically, uh, it, you have to differentiate between time series and uh, cross-sectional factors. Uh, for time series factor, it's actually pretty easy to compute uh, a uh, factor loading. You just take a long return series, as long as you like, one year, two years, five years, ten years, ideally, and then you regress the returns against a uh, macroeconomic factor such as inflation rate or such as HML returns or such as some, some other things. Simple enough, right? Because uh, again, co uh, time series factor uh, is uh, the same, the factor is the same for every stock, so it doesn't matter uh, you know, you can do it one stock at a time. This regression is certainly done one stock at a time. So you take Apple uh, returns and then regress uh, Apple against, uh, you know, the HML factor. And the HML factor is the same for Apple and Microsoft and Exxon and uh, Google and, uh, you know, um, whatever stock that you pick is the same. It's just that the regression coefficient will be different. Okay, so that's nothing uh, difficult. So you can use this regression coefficient uh, to uh, predict uh, what the Apple return is if you think that this factor is uh, very uh, useful for predicting Apple's return. Uh, of course, in order to, for the factor model to be predictive, you have to lag the return by one time step. You have to use yesterday factor to predict tomorrow's return. Uh, that is a technical detail actually uh, because many of these factors do not change very rapidly. Like the inflation rate is not going to change from you know, one month to another except when there's a you know, major change in the economy. So you know, whether you lack it or not, it's not likely to make a big difference. You, know, you can use this month's inflation rate to predict next month's uh, at, you know, Apple return. You know, of course, when you're back testing a model, you do need to lack it, but when you're computing the regression coefficient, the, the factor loading, it may not be that important to lack it because the macroeconomic factor does change much slower than the stock return. So that's a, just a technical detail that I want to uh, point out. Now, all good for the uh, time series factor. What about the cross-sectional factors? Now, as I mentioned, cross-sectional factors are easier to understand because they are observable. 
All right, it's comparatively easy to understand uh, as opposed to those, uh, you know, uh, time series factor, dividend yield, ROE, BOM. They they are called factor loadings to be precise. Uh, but uh, actually, they are easy to understand, but not as straightforward to compute. And the reason we will explain here. Uh, naively, it should be easy. You just take one snapshot in time, let's say, uh, you know, t minus 1, uh, and then you regress the one day return from t minus 1 to t, that is the dependent variable, and you regress it against the factor loadings of all the stocks for that uh, day, for day t minus 1, right? The factor loadings uh, of the stocks at t minus 1 is observable. They are the uh, ROE, they are the dividend uh, yield, they are the, uh, uh, um, you know, maybe one month return. So to, at T minus one, all these uh, factor loadings are known, and you're just going to regress uh, in, 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 a, in a back test situation, regress the future one day return, which is T minus one to one, against this known factor loadings. Sounds easy, you know, then you can get one number out of it. That's crucial. Right? In this regression, you are going to get um, just uh, for each factor loading, you are going to get just one uh, regression coefficient because you you know all uh, just you are just using uh, actually that that that's not true. You do get multi. This is a multi multivariate regression. So for each stock, obviously, you are going to get a uh, somewhat uh, uh, you know different factor loadings. But the problem with this naive way of uh, of uh, you know running a one day linear regression is that there's not sufficient data. Uh, the factors from one day to another will be very different. So even if you have 500 stocks, uh, you are not uh, going to get uh, enough data uh, to uh, generate. A, a stable uh, factor in this in this case. So uh, you know, and, and every day the factor will be different. So one day you will find that uh, you know it's Apple. Uh, if it's um, uh, if the ROE is high, you might uh, predict a uh, uh, you know 10 percent per annualized return. Another day will say that it will be 35 percent. So it's all very different. You know, this is a very unstable. Uh, uh, sort of uh, regression system. So the way to deal with this is that you have to aggregate the data, and there are two ways to aggregate data. Uh, one way you can aggregate data is that you can aggregate over many periods of history. So instead of just regressing it every day, uh, you know, from t minus one to one uh, t, and get a uh, re uh, regression coefficient out of it, you have to use even for a uh, cross-sectional model, you have to use a whole recent period. Uh, to uh, to regress it. What that means is that you will tie the regression coefficient, you force the regression coefficient over this whole period to the same number. You don't allow it to uh, to vary uh, very much. So actually that's that's the, the way to, to deal with it uh, in, in the literature. Now that's, you know, uh, it's just a little bit of a uh, uh, technicality. So, but interestingly, uh, Sometimes we don't even need to use linear regression. So here, let me talk. Uh, you know, we go from complicated to simple here. Uh, oftentimes, linear regression, uh, you know, it might sound simple enough, but it still assigns a different weight and different um, re regression coefficient uh, to every stock, and that uh, itself is oftentimes already overfitting because there is, even though you might be using, uh, you know, the, the procedure I described, you know, just uh, aggregating data over many period to get a more robust estimate of the in the equation, but sometimes even that is not robust enough. That is still overfitting the model. And you might consider, in this case, you might consider just using the sign of each coefficient. So full weight of magnitude, and you can. How do we, uh, you know, use the sign? Well, what that's saying is that uh, you can uh, say, you know, whenever there's a, a higher than uh, average uh, ROE, uh, we will assign a plus sign to it. So if ROE is is high, we expect the return to be high. Well, that's you know sounds intuitive, but we can do that for many other factors. So we are going to standardize each factor, first of all, by the mean and standard deviation uh, 
within the uh, the range of variation of these factors, such as the you know uh, how does the dividend yield, what's the mean of dividend yield, what is the standard deviation of dividend yield across the different stock, and then if you think that dividend yield, a high dividend yield portends a high return, you apply a positive sign to that factor. So here is an example. Let's say you are using ROE B over M and B over M as two factors uh, for for this cross-sectional model. Uh, ROE of a stock in an index, let's say, has a mean of 0.6 and standard deviation of 0.4. Uh, book to market ratio uh, of this same stock universe has a mean of 0.1 and standard deviation of 0.5. And let's say Microsoft is in that uh, stock universe and it currently has ROE of 0.3 and B, o M, B, of, B over M of 0.2, then the way to compute a factor for Microsoft would be very simple in this scheme. Uh, you just standardize, you, you find a standard score for each factor in, for Microsoft and then you add the factors with the correct sign. Bo, bo, in both cases we have a positive sign because we believe that in both cases um, uh, the, the factor will, will lead to a higher than average return, so we add them. Uh, if one of them uh, actually anti-correlate with pre to return, we'll, add a, we'll put a negative sign there. Now, do you see a problem with this approach in the context of multivariate linear regression? That's a, uh, that's a problem. Uh, so, uh, let, let's think about it for a while. You know, this sounds simple enough. But there are situations where this approach doesn't work. For those of you who are, you know, uh, conversant in statistics and particularly in regression, you'll see a problem. The problem with this approach is that it works very well if the factors themselves are uncorrelated uh, or, pe or close to uncorrelated. But if the factors themselves are in fact correlated, let's say B O M, uh, B over M is correlated with R O E. This particular way of generating a factor will cause problem because uh, the model can be unspecified, uh, can be misspecified. In other words, um, even though independently the correlation of ROE versus future return is positive and correlation of BOM with future, uh, with future return is positive, but if you put the two factors together and they have a correlation amongst themselves, it might well be the case that the sign uh, of one of them has to be changed, even though individually they should be all positive, but if you put them together in a linear regression model, uh, you might find that the sign actually will be negative for one of them. And so if you do that uh, and force the sign to be positive in our simplistic factor model, you know, the factor model that doesn't care about the magnitude uh, of the regression coefficient and you fix the regression coefficient to be minus one and plus one, you are going to get a misspecified model. So uh, that circumstance is uh, going to happen sometime. But you know, strangely enough, in practice, uh, we don't have to worry too much about that. Now, going simpler and simpler, even sometimes even this standardization is not uh, necessary. We don't need to even worry about the standard deviation or the mean of this factor. All you need to do sometimes is just to rank the stocks based on each factor and then add up those rank. Okay, so this has the flavor of uh, if you, again, if you are a statistics uh, nerd, you might remember there's a thing called uh, the Spearman rank correlation and there's a thing called Pearson classical correlation. A Spearman rank correlation is what we are doing now or more or less. Uh, you are using rank instead of the actual magnitude uh, of these uh, uh, you know of, of these factors. And the benefit of doing that is that oftentimes in linear regression uh, if if there's a factor that is an outlier, if a stock has an outlier, it will distort the mean regression coefficient. So the model will be will be um, distorted because of of just one stock, simply because it has a very large value. Using this kind of rank uh, ranking method will eliminate outliers. Will 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 uh, prevent this kind of a. Uh, outliers from distorting the model. So oftentimes it's, it's a good idea. So that's similar to the Spearman rank correlation. You're using that rank correlation rather than the Pearson classical correlation. Okay, so 
Alternatively, there's even a simpler way. Uh, you don't even have to add up the rank. So when, when I say adding up the rank, it means that, okay, with this factor, uh, IBM ranks third uh, based on ROE, and, uh, I, and, and then IBM ranks 10th based on uh, dividend yield, and IBM rank uh, 100 based on, uh, you know, uh, 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 book to market ratio, let's say, and then you will just add the rank of th three, seven, and one hundred. You know, let's say for IBM, that's the way I was imagining when you was, when I said that you should add the ranks instead of actually adding the standardized factors. But actually, there's a simpler way: is that you don't even need to add rank. You are doing. You can do what we call a multi-sort algorithm. In other words, you first sort a portfolio of stocks with one factor, maybe ROE and you pick the top and bottom quintile, and then within the top and bottom quintile, you sort them again using a different factor. So that, and you can repeat it as long as there's enough sort to form a portfolio. So after, you know, let's say sorting three times using three different factors, you can finally pick the top of the top of the top um, portion of that portfolio to long, and similarly pick the bottom of the bottom of the bottom portion of that portfolio uh, as the uh, short portfolio. And the reason that this works is that, you know, you might say, well, hey, but that doesn't actually allow us to predict returns. But, you know, our objective as traders is not to predict returns. That We'll leave that to the finance professor to do, the, as the job of the trader is to generate, uh, you know, trading signals. What do we want to buy? What do we want to sh uh, short? So this ranking obviously does not produce any expected returns, but it surely will produce a long short portfolio uh, that you can, you can trade. Okay, so <clears throat> Interestingly, even though it, this kind of uh, method uh, sounds very um, uh, crude and uh, you know arbitrary, and particularly for the uh, you know for example, I mentioned in a statistical sense they uh, they are biased, you know because they you have ignored the correlation between factors. Actually, the multi-sort algorithm does not. Uh, does not uh, ignore the correlation. The correlation of stocks uh, of the factors do not affect the model sort algorithm. It does affect the other two methods that I've described earlier. Uh, so actually, the model sort is is a standard usage uh, of the uh, you know of factor models by a lot of academic researchers because of this fact. But even though uh, you know you you use the other two methods uh, by by ignoring correlation between factors, they are still found to uh, outperform many regression-based methods. And that's not only true in finance, but it's true in many other areas of social science. If you read the book by the famous uh, Nobel Prize economist, Nobel laureate uh, Daniel Kahneman, you uh, call Thinking Fast and Slow, you'll see that uh, he, he mentioned this fact in that book. Okay, so now let's move on to some more uh, sort of uh, juicy stuff. Um, some of the exotic factors, and these factors are actually something that a shorter term trader can use. You don't have to be a Warren Buffett to make use of these factors, to, and you don't have to hold a stock for five years in order to benefit from them. You can hold a stock for not one minute, not even a day. Probably you can use it for a uh, holding period from a week to several months. So that's actually... Uh, these are factors that might be useful actually for traders. So the first factor is, is called variance risk premium. It's the difference between implied volatility and historical volatility. Now, um, and generally speaking, it was found that high variance risk premium predicts high a negative return. Okay, so if the implied vol exceeds historical vol uh, by a lot, you expect negative returns. The second one is called implied skew. Now, the skewness of returns uh, is is equal to uh, the difference between the the OTM call and put option prices. OTM being uh, out of the uh, money call and put option. So, uh, and this is again pretty intuitive. Uh, it says that uh, you know if you have a expensive uh, call. Uh, that means that uh, high in price, that means that, you know, people expect positive return. Option traders expect positive return if the call is more expensive than put. Uh, actually, the variance risk premium is also pretty uh, intuitive because people, uh, when there's a high in price volatility, that means people expect there's, uh, you know, some kind of uh, 
major event happening and typically the major event is not going to be good. <laughs> so that's why if you have a high impact war, uh, relative historical war, uh, people expect bad things to happen. Now interestingly, if you take a look at the what is called implied kurtosis, now kurt implied kurtosis is the difference between uh, the sum of the out of the money core and put option price and add the money core and put option price. Interestingly, high implied kurtosis predicts positive return. We would have thought that they would produce negative return because that seems to uh, be similar to variance uh, risk premium. You know, now we are measuring uh, instead of implied vol, we are measuring implied kurtosis. But vol, uh, you know, vol volatility and kurtosis are simply the the um, uh, the second moment and the fourth moment of returns, right? So they are both symmetric. So why is it that uh, you know vol, uh, high implied vol uh, generate positive expected return, but high kurtosis? Expect, uh, implied kurtosis generate negative expected, I mean sorry, high implied kurtosis generate positive return. This is a, seems to be unintuitive. It's a switch of sign. Well, if anybody, uh, you know, now first of all, the research may not be done right. I did, didn't do this research, but, uh, you know, oftentimes they are refuted in the future with more careful understanding. So if anybody can come up with a reason, that'd be great. Uh, but, uh, you know, we should treat this with a uh, you know, grain of salt. Um, we, we, we need to really look carefully at the research to see if this really holds. Okay. But in summary, uh, these three factors are telling us that options traders know best. Okay, so they are all, uh, you know, based on option prices and we are thinking that option traders know more than stock traders. So they, that's, what the, that's why they're predictive. Another factor that has nothing to do with option, fact, uh, option traders is the short interest. Now, the question is, does a high short interest ex uh, produce a high expected return or a low expected return? Uh, that actually depends on how exactly do you measure short interest. The sign of this dependence is very much dependent on the precise way you measure short interest, so that's interesting. There are two ways to measure short interest. One way is called the short interest ratio, short interest ratio, SIR. A short interest ratio is simply the number of uh, shorter shares of a stock uh, divided by uh, the uh, total uh, shares outstanding. Right? Simple. SIR is a, a number of shorter shares divided by total shares outstanding. Now, if you use SIR to measure short interest, you will find that a high SIR will imply a high expected return. Okay, so what that means is a little bit in unintuitive. High short interest in this case imply high expected return, or more precisely, high SIR implies high expected return. That's something that actually the block CEO hedge block mentioned. Uh, they show, you know, in particular in 2013, the worst, the most shorter stocks all had the best returns. That's a, a striking chart uh, that uh, you can find on my blog actually, that reproduced on my blog. Uh, the, the, the most shorter stock had the best return last year. This year has not been so prominent, but over the longest time period, that is true. Uh, the law shorter, the more, uh, the higher the SIR, the higher the expected return. Now, on the other hand, if you measure short interest using a different variable called days to cover, DTC, days to cover is defined as how many days of volume is needed to cover the entire short interest. So let's say suddenly you have a short squeeze and everybody want to get out of the short position. Well, how many days volume is needed for everybody to get out their short position and cover the short? So that's called day to cover, DTC. And if you use DTC as a measure of short interest, interestingly, it got, you get the opposite uh, sign. A high DTC uh, implies a low expected return. So that is more intuitive. You, if you use DTC as a measure of short interest, you get a more intuitive result, meaning that low short interest generate high return. You know, so in this case, you can interpret it as saying that the short sellers know best because the short seller is, uh, you know, if, a lot, if there are a lot of short sellers, that means you should expect low return. So interestingly, DTC is more conventional, is more intuitive, and it tells you the short seller look, look no best. But if you measure SIR, uh, you get the opposite. 
Okay, uh, liquidity is another uh, uh, interesting uh, factor. It turns out that low liquidity uh, generate high future expected return. Uh, that may not be so um, uh, unintuitive. Right now, for example, we are in a low liquidity period, and low liquidity is often accompanied by low volatility. Right? Nobody trades, and nobody uh, change hands. So. Uh, the stocks do not change hands much, and so that w the reason they don't change hands is people think that in the future, you know, you get good positive return. So you know, hold on to what you have. That's the uh, uh, sort of the notion. So one final uh, factor that I want to mention is the new sentiment. Uh, new sentiment is a newfangled factor that is generated by new natural language processing algorithm. They pass the news. Uh, news feed automatically for each stock and generate a sentiment score assigned to each story about the stock, uh, indicating whether the, the, this story is likely to have a positive or negative price impact. So you add up all the sentiment score for uh, a fixed period of time uh, and then that would be the aggregate sentiment score for a uh, stock price. Uh, and supposedly, based on the research by the company, Ravenpack.com, that uh, sell this kind of data and models, uh, they are, you know, if you form a long shot portfolio of stocks by ranking their sentiment score, using sentiment score essentially as a factor, you get a pretty good or very good future returns. So, uh, of course, bias beware because this is a research done by the company itself. Uh, the department just sell you this data uh, itself. Anyway, so that's all for the uh, you know a, a quick walkthrough of the survey of all these uh, exotic factors. Uh, let let me go back to some of the nuances of uh, you know building a factor model. And some these are nuances that actually I touched upon earlier. And that is to say that if you are ranking stock based on uh, a single factor. Okay, if you're using a factor model with small number of factors, maybe single factor, maybe just a small handful of factors, uh, beware that the regression coefficient might change when you are running this factor model on two different universes. Whether you are running on small cap universe or large cap universe, the factor regression coefficient, the factor loading sign might change. So that's very interesting uh, in some sense because it means that, uh, and, and that's a general phenomenon of uh, you know building multiple regression model. You know when a multiple regression model does not have all the factors that are relevant for predicting returns, if you just intentionally leave out some factors, let's say you are only using one factor or two factors instead of using ten factors that might actually accurately describe uh, predict the return of the stock. That is, this kind of incomplete model uh, will generate strange regression coefficient. In particular, uh, that's what we see. If the regression, the sign of the regression coefficient will change between large cap and small cap stocks. So, what do we do in this case? Well, one way, simple way to do is that you really cannot apply the same factor. So, we really have to segregate your stocks. Uh, you know, when you're running factor model. Do not, you know, if you're using an incomplete factor model, do not mix up large cap and small cap stock. Do not mix up, for instance, even growth stock and value stock. So you have to be very careful in segregating stock. In other words, making sure that some of the important factors are uniform within your universe. Otherwise, it can cause a big problem with your factor model. The second uh, as a related nuance is that um, uh, that is the reason why some factor models do not work on all industry group. And you know, one of the simple factor models that Joe Greenblatt's uh, you know book uh, talk about that's the little um, little book that uh, beats the market. You know, you might have heard of his uh, famous little book uh, about the two factor model. In the two factor model, they recommend that you all exclude finance stocks and maybe sometimes utility stocks from building a factor model. You know, you might say, why? This is very strange uh, that this is an ad hoc. Well, it's not ad hoc because uh, this ad hoc, it is ad hoc, but the reason you have to do that is because the factor model is incomplete. You have not included all possible factors. You have not in this included, let's, let's say, industry factors. 
you have not, you know, that's all. It's, it's the price to pay for having such a simple factor model that you have to make sure that your uh, universe is very uniform. So some industry group just doesn't work, so you have to exclude them. So that's related to the issue of you have to segregate large cap and small cap or value and growth stock when you don't include the factors that uh, relate to them. So that's uh, a little bit of technical nuance that I want to throw in when you are building a factor model. Anyway, uh, that's, uh, I think we have talked, I have talked enough and I'm certainly happy to take questions. Before I take questions, uh, let me uh, tell you that I am uh, running my next online workshop on momentum strategies in December. So if you want to sign up, they, the, the, the people do go in, uh, you know, sign up pretty fast. So, uh, you know, they, I, I limit each online workshop to six. Uh, people, so if you do want to sign up, please go to my website and do please keep in touch via Twitter and also uh, by posting comments and questions on my blog. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Ernie. So before we give away the books, let me see um, if there's any questions. So if you guys have questions, you can go ahead and type them now. Ernie, it was a really great presentation. I think that I will definitely be uh, re-watching that recording a few times for my own personal use. Um, and by the way, I, I noticed at the top, I, I'm not sure if you know or not, but about, um, I don't know, eight months ago, I finally gave up on retail platforms and I started doing my own thing with Python and R. And I noticed oh. that, that you're using MATLAB. So I'm just curious what your, what your take is on MATLAB versus R. Well, um, I like MATLAB because it is, um, a uh, very user-friendly uh, platform. Uh, it has a uh, very uh, great debugger. Uh, you can compare multiple arrays side by side, just like an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, you, uh, you know, when you want to examine a, the the content of a variable, you just need to move your cursor, uh, your 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 cursor to to that variable, and a JavaScript will immediately pop up to show you what's inside. So. There's all kinds of bells and whistles that I find really uh, useful for production, uh, for, for, for increasing productivity. Sure. And one uh, historical reason why people prefer R versus MATLAB is they say, well, R is free and MATLAB is <laughs> expensive. Yeah. That reason is no longer an excuse because MATLAB is now selling for $150. Oh, really? Nice. Yeah, yeah I, uh, I don't know. I, I guess it kind of comes down to what you maybe get started with is what you stick with because you know now that I've invested even just a small amount of eight months or whatever it's been into R, I can't see myself changing, and I'm sure you feel the same. So. Well, actually, I, I know R as well. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, you know, because I'm uh, now uh, a, um, a teaching uh, a uh, finance course at Northwestern University, uh, master degree program in predictive analytics. Uh, they uh, use nice. R in their courses. Right. So I have to learn R, and I did. And, uh, you know, so that's why I say I'm a pretty honest uh, comparison. I can have, right. have an unbiased comparison. Right. Nice. Them. Good job. Okay, let's take a look. Um, he is asking, how do you compute those exotic factors and where did you find the free options data? Oh, um, options data are uh, seldom uh, free, <laughs> I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, but uh, you, the best bet is to try quando.com. Uh, let me yep. type my thing here. Yeah. Quando. Uh, now, I don't know for a fact where the quando has it. Quando, if anywhere has free data, quando would have it. But, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, co-option data is not uh, easy to find free. <laughs> yep. As well as historical. I mean, live co-option data is free on Yahoo Finance. Uh, but historical data is a different matter. Right. Yeah, there's a, there's a good thread on BMT about Quandl that, um, you know, there's a lot of people that have already written to their API and incorporated. Like I, I just saw somebody write a Ninja Trader indica indicator for um, uh, commitment of traders that so automatically pulls the COT data. Uh, so there's a lot of things you can do with that API. It's really great. Yeah. Um, Another question, Familia, he's saying, hey, uh, could you please do a massive open online course? Oh, <laughs> um, 
Well, <laughs> I uh, don't know quite how to answer that. This is part of a you know, fairly open course, I guess. Uh, but, uh, you know, well, let me think about it. There's, <laughs> I, I will keep that in mind. Yeah, it, I think there's a site out there. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly or not. Uh, Coursera? Uh, C O U yes. yeah Coursera okay there I see a lot of threads about them doing big classes from time to time I'm not sure if maybe that's what he's referring to right right well that's uh, the um, you know I should I, I love uh, M O C uh, don't uh, get me wrong but M O C is usually given by uh, esteemed professors in esteemed universities. Right, they are uh, started by people, you know, who Harvard professor give a class and two million people view it, or Stanford <laughs> AI professors uh, went and uh, you know ten million people see it. Uh, they can afford to do that because they are paid by Harvard and uh, you know Stanford. Uh, I unfortunately is an entrepreneur, and uh, you know, so I have to charge for <laughs> what I teach. I, I you know I don't get a salary from a university, so, so that's not really suitable actually for you know a certain. Uh, you know, trainers. Sure, I understand. Um, Bob wants to know, does this apply to trading futures? I mean, you pretty much talked about equities today or options on equities. What about futures? Uh, they are, uh, well, there are uh, factors for uh, futures. Uh, you know, in, in some sense, uh, you know, a simple uh, thing such as uh, uh, you know, row returns, and uh, you know, basically return in or some you know just row return in some looked at period. That's a factor, and that's actually uh, you know work pretty well for for futures. So and also, particularly macroeconomic factors certainly is relevant for to futures, right? So we 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 know that um, uh, in a uh, you know let's say if you're talking about bond futures, obviously the uh, you know the inflation rate is a a, a important predictive variable. Right. So different futures will be very sensitive to different macroeconomic factors, particularly bonds or energy futures and some other. Uh, do you do you feel the same way about ETFs? I mean, I mean, uh, that, you know, you if, if you're looking at ETFs instead of individual equities, is what I mean. Or if your goal is to trade ETFs. Oh, okay. Yes, that exactly. Yes, ETF. Uh, you know, there are many kinds. Obviously, for example, if you're talking about sector ETFs, right? So if you talk about consumer um, uh, cyclicals, obviously they are uh, affected by economic growth. Uh, they are in, affected by uh, you know, let's say interest rate. You know, if interest rate is high, people might be unwilling to consume much because all their money is used to pay mortgages. So, uh, you know, so certainly again, uh, macroeconomic factors will be uh, you know very relevant to trading ETFs. Right. Okay. All right. Um, I don't see too many other questions that you haven't already a answered. Hang on. Just got one. Roger wants to know if Ernie is using exotic factors for your own trading. I imagine I yes, have, right? <laughs> yeah. Actually, I investigated each of these factors uh, because I read them in a paper and uh, I uh, immediately uh, you know, go back test it myself to mm -hmm. determine if it's suitable. Right. Uh, what I find often is that uh, my conclusion often differs from what the uh, researcher uh, proposed, mm -hmm. and particularly with more recent, uh, more, with more recent data. So, uh, you know, and sometimes the uh, even though it does generate return. Uh, the sharp ratio is too low for my own uh, uh, trading, for my funds trading. Right. So remember, I talk about you know why is it the fact that these factors who are well known to have good returns uh, are still there? You know why is it not arbitrage away? It comes back to that question. The reason they are not arbitrage away is that they have long periods of drawdown, then they might be very steep drawdown occasionally, right. and that's why I don't trade them because you know I I can't afford to lose money for three years. In a row. Well. You know, the first thing that came to mind when you said that you uh, you read the research and then you do your own and reach a different conclusion is is that uh, famous quote: "Lies, damn lies, and statistics." Um, because you can make you can make a, a paper reach reach a conclusion really whatever conclusion you'd like. It's very biased from a lot of different factors, right? Even if they don't intend it to be. Yeah. So you have to be extremely careful um, when you're. You don't just assume what you what you read is. Is going to apply accurately to the way that you're trading the market, right? 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, so, okay, so um, I don't see any other questions, and we're at an hour, so this is a good point to go ahead and, and do the book. So before we do the five books, I just want to remind everybody that um, Ernie's going to read the question, and then we're going to have you type in the answer. Ernie will pick the, uh, the best answer, and I will then ask for your BMT username, and uh, I will get in touch with you after the webinar is done so that I can get your address and stuff to get the autograph books to you. Okay, Ernie, uh, do you have the questions panel up so you can see the questions coming in or the answers coming in? Uh, I can see the, uh, yeah, the questions okay. panel. Right now I see a lot of questions there already, so I, I'm guessing that people will be uh, uh, typing in the answers on right. that same uh, Same one. Mm -hmm. panel. Okay, yep. Okay. so first question is, uh, this is an easy one, by the way. <laughs> Why is it e less easy to arbitrage away Effective returns as opposed to the so called offers that hedge funds love. Why is it less easy to arbitrage away those factor returns? Okay, getting some answers. Let's see where. Yep, I think they are all. Uh, uh, Correct. Uh, I think the first uh, person uh, who uh, typed in the correct answer is uh, Chris Jones. Right. Not? Okay, okay, Chris, I need your yeah. BMT username, please. Okay, so book number two. Okay. Uh, is inflation rate a cross-sectional or a time series factor for stocks? Okay, so uh, it's indeed a uh, time series factor uh, and uh, I think uh, here uh, if I sorry yep. if I pronounce it incorrectly uh, got the first uh, right answer yep and uh, I already know your username uh, Chris still waiting for your BMT username please type it in okay um, number three book number three okay um, if implied skewness is positive Okay, if implied skewness is positive, does that mean that options traders think the stock will break out on the upside? Uh, that's the first part of the question. <laughs> uh, also, does that mean that OTM calls, out of the money calls, are more expensive than our OTM puts? Does that mean calls are more expensive than puts? Okay, so uh, uh, Mike, do you believe that uh, BP is the one who uh, got it first? If I read it correctly, yes, yes, is yes, that okay? Yep. Yeah. All right. Okay, so, then. so BP, I need your BMT username, please. Okay. So, book number four. Okay. Um, why do we sometimes? have to build factor models for small cap versus large cap stocks separately. Why can't we just mix up, you know, build a factor model for 1,000 stocks at the same time? Okay. I think the best answer so far is uh, CB. Uh, regression sign might change. That's right. the most precise answer, yes. Okay, so CB, I need your BMT username, please. All right, and last book, book number five. Okay. Uh, what are the two ways to measure short interest for a stock? You can either give the acronym or just a few words. Okay, Stacy, I think, is fast and <laughs> correct. <laughs> yeah. All right, Stacy, I need your BMT username. Okay, let me write down CB's. Okay, all right guys, so congratulations on winning uh, one of the books, if you did, and I will be in touch with you in just a minute as soon as this webinar is over via private message, so please reply back as soon as you can. I'll send all the info to Ernie. He will uh, help me out greatly by shipping these directly to you since I'm in Ecuador, and that would be quite difficult for me to do. Okay. All right, so Ernie, I really, really appreciate it, like always, uh, fantastic job. And um, I hope to see you back soon uh, for another webinar, maybe early next year. Okay, thank any, you very much uh, for inviting. Yeah, one last question. Any, any plans for another book? Uh, not uh, 
no concrete plans yet. Uh, you know, I'm, when I collect enough materials, typically it takes me, you know, three years to learn enough and, you know, did enough research to mm -hmm. to to have uh, sufficient material for both. So yeah, maybe another another two years. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sounds good. All right, guys, thanks, Ernie. Thanks, guys. Okay, thanks. Good night to uh, to everybody. All right, bye.